You've decided you're ready to become a parent, and suddenly you're overwhelmed with people who feel they have the right to inform you on the correct way to conceive, give birth, what fears you should have, and the proper way to parent. How do you filter through the opinions? How do you know what's trustworthy information and what's a myth or just plain outdated? Welcome to the Birth Ease Podcast. Join your host, Michelle Smith, and her guests as they cut through the noise and fear by sharing valuable tips, tools, and proven methods to help you connect with your own inner wisdom as you navigate the sacred journey that is pregnancy, birth, and parenthood in a more relaxed and confident manner. This podcast does not constitute, nor is it intended, as medical advice. Hello, Birthies families. Welcome to your reprieve from the noise and stress that can often accompany pregnancy, birth, and parenthood. I'm your host, Michelle Smith. On today's podcast, I will be having another candid conversation with Meg Folsom, a fellow birth guardian, and today we're going to be discussing a bit of a heavier topic. We're going to discuss birth trauma and practices that were in place when we each gave birth. My birth was 33 years ago and 26 years ago, and hers was 40 years ago and 34 years ago. And I'm so honored you're here and that we can have this candid conversation. Well, thanks for having me, Michelle. Before we get started with your first birth story, and I'm sharing my birth story, I want to let the audience know that this could possibly be material that's triggering for some of us. So if you find that your heart rate's changing or you're feeling overwhelmed or you feel like crying, feel free to pause the episode, stop and take some breaths, walk around, wash your face, do something to help release that stress and you can come back to it at another time if you need to or call a friend to have a discussion, reach out to your midwife or you can even email me and we can help you to work through it because it is a very big heavy subject and I'd like to say that things are changing for the better and they are but there are still very much instances of loss of autonomy and birth trauma happening so if you're ready Meg please share with us about your first birth experience well I had my son 40 years ago in the hospital I had started childbirth classes. Um, My partner at the time was out of the country. I had a girlfriend who went with me, and it felt so awkward being two women in a childbirth class amongst all these couples that I never continued with the classes. So when I felt like I, I was pretty sure I was in labor, I was four days past my due date, and I was having stronger contractions. They felt like really, really bad menstrual cramps. I called the doctor's office. I had an appointment at two, so he told me just to keep it and come in, which I did. I uh, asked my father to take me just because I didn't feel comfortable driving. And when I got there, he told me, yes, you're in labor. I think you should go ahead and go on to the hospital. I said, okay. I wasn't ready to go to the hospital at that time. I was by myself. My husband was not here with me. I had a girlfriend who was going to go with me, but I just, I just didn't want to go. So my father took me home and I felt like I had some things I needed to get done. So I uh, I proceeded to go shopping to get thank you cards and things like that. And around seven o'clock, my contractions picked up, and so I called my girlfriend, and she came and got me, and we went on up to the hospital. Again, I didn't know anything. They took off all my clothes or had me take off my clothes, started the IV, put me in a bed, put on the monitors to monitor his heart rate, and we just kind of laid there in a the bed, not knowing anything, me not knowing anything. The next thing I know, they come in, they do an IV. They tell me they're going to give me an enema, which I wasn't really sure I knew exactly what that was. But I did find out quite quickly. 
again, no pre-warning, no, this is what's going to feel like. They, uh, it was very, very vulnerable feeling. And then they take you and put you in the bathroom and leave you. And that, again, was just very uncomfortable. That's putting it mildly. <laughs> yes. And then I, I go, you know, back to bed again. And now my son's heart rate started to deteriorate. They weren't comfortable with how his heart rate was. So they went ahead and had me uh, lay on my left side. Again, not explaining anything to me. Then they came in and told me they were going to shave my pubic area. And I was like, what? You're going to what? And not, again, not, this is what we're doing. It was so uncomfortable. It was like, no Scary. shaving cream. Share, yeah, there's a woman down there with a razor and no shaving cream. And I was like, oh, my God, this is humiliating. And so I had to stay on my left side. The contractions were increasing. I'd asked for something for pain, and I couldn't get anything. They told me my son was in distress, so they came and, and put a little thing on his head to monitor him and, and my contractions. And again, I didn't understand that they were actually sticking something in his head. Poor little boy had a little scratch on his head after the fact. Then the next thing I know, they're like, yeah, we're going to type and cross-match for blood. We're going to probably end up doing a C-section. My contractions are coming one on top of the other, and I don't know what's going on. I'm trying to do the breathing that they teach you, the hee-hee-ho-ho, -ho, and yeah, that's a joke. And so I think in high, I mean, I, I don't remember exactly, but I remember thinking to myself, there is no way I'm having a C-section, and I'm going to push. And I must have now, know, knowing what I know now, must have been able to push through that cervix. And then they're going to tell me they're going to cut me and do an episiotomy. And I'm like, what? I have my baby. They take him away. My parents had gotten to the, the hospital, and, and I didn't even get to name my own baby. They asked my mother what his name was. You're kidding. No. And she knew what I had decided to name him, so she told them what his name was. Then they wheeled me out and left me in the hallway on a gurney. Oh, God. My girlfriend who was with me had to work the next day, so she had to leave. So I laid in the hallway by myself, not knowing if my son was okay or not, and then took me to a, a room. And I don't even remember when I saw my son again. I, was, I don't know if it was later that evening, but I just remember trying to nurse him and having a hard time and they brought me this nipple shield that looked like a Playtex nurser nipple mm. and had me put that on to nurse him and when I took it off it was full of stuff but I don't know if he got it it was colostrum but I don't know if he got any of it then the next morning they come in and tell me to spread my legs and they're putting a, a hot light bulb a hot lamp in between my legs to dry everything up and I'm like okay if I haven't been through enough you're now telling me you're gonna put this heat lamp to dry my crotch I was horrified like could somebody tell me what's going on and I don't even remember what they gave me to wear but I know it was uncomfortable I do remember that part thinking god this is a, this hurts and then they told me to spray something down there. And I'm like, okay, because I didn't know what I, I was 25, didn't know what, really didn't know anything, honestly didn't know anything. And I just went over along like a little sheep being dragged to the shearing shack is kind of what I felt like. So yeah, that was pretty traumatic. And then I was scared to go to the bathroom when I got home. Nobody tells you about all that stuff. And taking care of it and taking care of yourself and the baby and oh good lord ladies whatever you do do not let yourself get constipated because that on top of an episiotomy holy moly yeah thank goodness they don't cut them routinely anymore yeah it's very there's a time and a place sometimes but 
they don't do them routinely anymore, thank God. So, yeah, it's... Birth was barbaric in many ways. I don't even... Like, I did Lamaze, too. And I remember leaving Lamaze, though, not not like nowadays where women are afraid if they can give birth naturally. I don't know that that was our fear back then as much as it is now, but we were induced all the time either. But I remember leaving Lamaze, being afraid that I would push too soon, probably so I wouldn't swell my cervix, right? And that I wouldn't breathe right, that I was going to breathe wrong while I was giving birth. And when I went into labor, I lost my mucus plug that morning. I was so excited. I had to show it to my husband. I don't think he was very excited, but I was, right? (laughs) And I went to the doctor's office. He was wise in saying, well, you're 39 weeks and six days. You lost your mucus plug. You're only one centimeter. I'm most likely going to see you next week. This is your first baby, but you can't predict a woman. Back then, they didn't want you to go back to work or anything. So I went to my mom's and took a nap and had a contraction that felt different. And an hour later, had another one that felt different and thought I could be in labor. We had dinner, and finally my husband said, I think it was about 10 o'clock or so, 10.30, can we please go home? Because if this is labor, we need to get sleep. So I went home, and you're going to laugh at this being a birth professional, right? But... I was so excited because I woke up at 2.30 or 3 in the morning and my contractions were two to three minutes apart, right? So I thought that I was in transition, right? (laughs) (laughs) But now I know they were not strong enough. They were not long enough. I was way too happy still. You know, if I had made that much cervical change, I would have seen some bloody show that happens as your cervix changes and those little capillaries break. So I got to the hospital and I remember hearing the nurse saying, she's one centimeter, um, but I think she's in labor. And so the doctor said that they could keep me. They would have been much smarter to go home, but back then they kept you. And I too got to experience the wonders of that hospital enema, the giant sudsy enema. That is an experience like no other when you're having contractions and you're sitting on that toilet. It's been 33 years and I still remember that feeling. And before that, you know, I never had an enema and this nurse is giving you an enema, somebody you don't know, and then they have this razor down there at your most intimate parts and you're like, oh dear God, are they gonna cut me? And you know, back then we did not pay people to wax out our pubic <laughs> hair, right? So it stayed the, where it was supposed to be. Right? You didn't wax, you didn't shave, you didn't pull out. So it was just so shocking, and they were so worried about germs that they had to shave you. So fast forward, and I'm contracting and having back labor, and they wouldn't let me out of the bed. You're expected to stay, lean back, and be in the bed, and be a good patient. I was self-pay back then and had no idea how I was going to pay for an epidural but I was in so much pain and I wanted a natural birth I just could not I couldn't take it anymore because I couldn't move I couldn't help my baby rotate I couldn't do anything so I got an epidural and I must have had one of the meanest anesthesiologists available My baby's heart rate had also started going down during this time, and they gave me Pitocin to speed the labor, and my body loves Pitocin, and I'll dilate very quickly, I've discovered, but her heart rate must have been going down, and they did, I don't know if they did it with you, Meg, but it was like they inserted this cone, and then they would scratch the baby's head to get a blood sample to test the oxygen level and the pH, so they did that, which was scary, And then they did that scalp electrode that you were talking about, the scratches the baby's head. They made me sign the paperwork for a cesarean. So as they're dosing it, I could have already had the epidural at this point and they were changing the level. You know, it's 33 years ago, it's hard to remember, but this lady was so mean because back then they would use a sharp needle to test the strength of your epidural. This woman is poking my belly, asking me if I can feel it. And I said, yes, I can. 
well, I need to know when it feels like this. And so she would poke my arm and she stabbed my arm so hard the next day it was covered in scabs. Just mean, incredibly mean. I had wanted birth rooms. They were starting to do birth in the same room and I wanted a birth room. But of course, with everything going on, that wasn't gonna happen. And my doctor preferred the delivery room anyway. So they wheel me back and I finally get, I was completely dilated and I get to push. And I'm there in this delivery room and everybody's bustling around. And my epidural is dosed for a cesarean. And then they're like, oh, you can watch the monitor. And if you feel a contraction, just go ahead and push. I don't know how quick that baby's going to come out. And they're telling me to go ahead and just push with the contractions. Wow. Yeah. Of course I don't. And I'm just in shock and scared. The doctor comes in and he decides to use forceps, which was very common back then. And I have talked to some of my friends and other people that have had forceps. They didn't necessarily have this experience, but I think she must have been very high in my pelvis. And I just remember the feeling of him yanking my baby out with those forceps. It's a feeling that, thank God you can't remember pain, but it's a feeling that I won't forget. And back then they would dose an epidural and it would wear off and they would redose them. But that shocked feeling, and my baby's head comes out, and my obstetrician, who I trusted and thought had my best interest at heart, says to my husband, come look, Dad, this is why you pay me so much money. Most men, especially back then, are afraid to see the baby be born And my poor former husband walks over, probably sees our poor daughter's face that's already starting to bruise. And then he yanks the rest of her out and she's born and of course she has to go to the warmer and her dad goes with her and they're trying to get the placenta out and he starts yanking on the cord. Not a good plan, as you know. And the cord separates from the placenta Thank goodness I had an epidural because he had to reach in and grab that placenta out of my body, you know, into my uterus. And then it wasn't until I became a doula that I understood what happened and did training and birth, but they have the mirrors in the OR and, you know, it was an OR delivery room. And I looked up and out of my body, there is just this waterfall hemorrhage blood is pouring out of me like a waterfall and I see that and then they're rubbing on my uterus and they must have gotten it back under control and wondering where my baby is and oh and he starts repairing me those outer stitches I understand now as a birth professional that you know it is harder to get that area numb but I had a pretty extensive tearing and episiotomy it was almost a fourth degree or probably was a fourth degree which is about as bad as it can get and he is doing that repair and I keep saying ouch I can feel that I can feel that and he's like it's okay I'm almost done I'm almost done the anesthesiologist says I can give her some more and he says no no I'm almost done and The anesthesiologist kindly does give me more medication and he's saying, but if you hear any ringing in your ears or feel weird, you need to let me know. Well, I felt all that, but I'm so shocked. I didn't even feel like I could say anything. Then after the repair is done, he says to my husband, I put an extra stitch in there for you, dad, which is completely so uncalled for. Yeah. Yeah, inappropriate. So, so inappropriate. Anyway, that's a whole other subject. But that whole husband's stitch, if you don't know what that is, they put in an extra stitch to make the opening to your vagina tighter for your husband's pleasure, which makes it horribly uncomfortable for you. And I already have a fourth degree tear. So they bring my little baby over to me, wrapped up like a burrito. And... 
hold her up above me and I just reach up with two fingers to try to touch my baby and the anesthesiologist grabs my arms and holds my hands down and won't let me touch my own baby because I might have germs on my fingers or something. They were so obsessed with germs back then. The trauma, like the other stuff, I could almost let go of with that trauma of having them hold my hands down and not let me touch my baby was so... I don't even have words. And so at some point I got her back and they're wheeling me out and I have her in my arms and I'm shocked and I'm bruised and I kind of see my mom and get to the room. And of course they take the baby to the nursery back then. So Mm -hmm. your child goes through all this trauma of being born with forceps and you're separated. I mean, you were left on a gurney for Christ's sake. Yep. And what we used to do to our mothers and our babies is horrendous. But I did get to, you know, back then too, when people would visit, they had to put on gowns. Do you remember? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So you wouldn't be too germy or dirty. So I was self-pay, which now people would just, everybody wants a self-pay patient. Back then it was worse than, it was just considered terrible. When you gave birth, did you have the postpartum rooms where you were just separated by curtains and you had to share a toilet with other women or did you get a private room? I didn't get a oh, private room. Oh no, I didn't have a private room. Yeah, I no. didn't either because no. I was self-pay. So and you're hearing other people and their families and all this going on and the physician let me go home. I think I went home after 24 hours, which was kind of unheard of. Yeah, I then. think I was in there for three or four days. Yeah, so he let me go home. And I remember when you were talking about the heat lamp, I was like, yep, I remember that heat lamp. But actually, it was kind of helpful because I remember when I got home, because they were talking about it helping, finding a little lamp and laying in the bed and putting it between my legs to help heal because I was so incredibly sore from that episiotomy. Just for people who don't know, tell them what a fourth degree tear involves. It is the most severe. For me, I had extensive stitches inside of my vagina, and the tear extends from the opening of your vagina down into your rectum. Yeah, it's it's pretty, pretty, like Michelle said, very intense, and it, it is the worst, and it can cause lifelong problems. Yeah, I am fortunate that he was evidently a good surgeon, and I gave birth vaginally again, but... Just the lack of respect was so awful, the way we were treated back then. Um, I don't know, how was your, how was your subsequent birth? Was it any Well, better? the second one, again, a second babies tend to come faster, and so um, my contractions were really strong. I had a really hard time walking from the car just to the emergency room because it was nighttime. But again, it was the whole thing. I mean, I was contracting back to back. I had a nurse. I had the curtains. Other people in the room did the same thing. Gave me the enema, put me in the bathroom, and left me. Mm -hmm. Like, sitting on the, the toilet, using the bathroom, which causes cramping, on top of the contractions, I couldn't get up. And every time I tried to get up to walk back to my bed, I couldn't. I couldn't find a button to push. I couldn't find a cord to pull. I, I think I was crying, actually, when I think about it, because I thought, how am I going to get out of here and get back to my bed? And let's see, I was I was 34 at the time, and it's 34 years ago. And I finally get back into the room, and she comes in with the razor, and I'm like, are you kidding me? And she goes, oh, well, now we only do what we call a a poodle shave. (laughs) And I'm like, well, I know what a poodle looks like. What is a poodle shave? So they just leave like a little strip of pubic hair. And don't ask me what the purpose of all that. I just remember her saying it's a poodle shave. No, to keep away germs. To keep, yeah. To keep, keep, because my self-cleaning vagina can't... 
keep away germs. Well, and they have to do their episiotomy and, you know, they need the area clean. Exactly. To right. And so... Um, how did you even stay still? Like, how did you stay still? I don't even know. If you're... I, I can't even imagine. Because that's the thing, too. Like, they're shaving you. Mm -hmm. You're contracting like crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't... You need to poop. And... Yeah. And you have to stay still. And, I, and I don't then, know how we came out. And then you hear, and you hear the people next to you talking. And you're like, am I in some kind of a nightmare? <laughs> um, the only thing I think, I do remember just being very excited to know whether or not I was having a boy or a girl. Mm. Because you didn't find mm. out in those right. days. And right. actually, you didn't have epidurals back then. Now, I think... Winter Park was not doing epidurals, but oh, Florida right. was because I remember asking. So you you didn't have an option of whether or not you're doing a natural birth or not. You were just doing it because I remember asking about an epidural and then uh, my doctor saying, no, we don't. Winter Park doesn't do epidurals, oh. but they did give you a fancy dinner. Oh, well, so. I, got, I got an epidural <laughs> and a fancy dinner at ORMC. Okay. <laughs> so. They don't do that anymore. Champagne and Yeah, tea. and then I remember feeling like I needed to pee really bad. And I remember asking the nurse, telling her I needed to go to the bathroom again. And she said, no, you, you can't get out of bed. And I'm like, but I have to pee. No, it's the baby's head. No, I, I have to pee. And so she gave me a bedpan. Now, imagine that trying to squat on a bedpan you've got people talking outside your curtain oh you're having back-to-back -back contractions oh my lord I couldn't pee and finally I had to tell her I can't I can't go and she goes well I told you it was a baby's head so rudely then she did a vaginal check and I remember it hurting so bad and I actually have a picture of her hand because my husband was really good at taking pictures and stuff and I have a picture of her hand with her long fingernails and then uh when I got ready to push, the doctor saying to me, uh, again, the doctor I didn't care for delivered my baby, the same one I didn't care for who delivered my son six years earlier, I got the jackpot again. And um, them telling me, whatever you do, do not go, don't touch your baby. Go under the blue paper, meaning the sterile blue wrap paper. And so I had this paper on me. And they, you know, so I, I push her out, and I don't even remember the pushing part, to be honest. I just remember knowing that I had a little girl, and then putting her on top of my, put, putting her on my chest, but on top of this paper. Well, as a mother, my reaction was to touch my baby, right. and them yelling right. at me for touching my own baby under the paper. Isn't it insane? And I'm like, thinking, this is my baby. I'm touching my baby. Yeah. And and being chastised for touching my own child? Yeah, and having your hands held. Down. And I, it's yeah. Awful. It's I remember just awful. I don't remember so much with the second one, but I know with my son when you were mentioning you could feel them doing the suturing, I could feel the suturing with my son. And I remember saying to them, I can feel it. It hurts. I'm almost done. I almost done. I don't know how many stitches I had, but I swear he wasn't almost done. I could feel every, it had to have been 20, yeah. 20 little pinches I felt. And, uh, and why, why would you, why would you do that to a woman? Right. Did you hate your mother? Right. Did you not get potty trained correctly? I don't know. I don't understand. I don't, I, I don't understand the, the process back then. And then my, my last baby, they didn't do any of that stuff. They just, and how Let long me ago be. was that? 23 years. 23 years, yeah. And they did have epidurals then. Uh, of course, I didn't, again, know what an epidural was. I must say, though, epidurals have their place in the birth world. They do. They but do. they Absolutely. should never be forced on a woman. And when we have women leaving leaving the birth center, saying they're just, you know, and I, again, I hate the terminology they give it, but the failure to progress. Nobody's failed to progress. You're just exhausted. You're 18 hours in, and, and you you know you still have a long ways to go. And our protocol and our licensing says we have to send you in after X amount of hours, long hours. We're talking 18, 24 hours without cervical change. Right, not just oh. And I tell I tell the patients, you know what? You've worked so hard. You are exhausted. Your baby needs to rest. Roll over, get the epidural, and get some sleep because 
you still have to push this baby out. Right. So epidurals have their place in the birth, but they should never be pushed on a woman. And, and I think they used to be. Yeah, I think it's just pretty yeah. much routine. Is like you go in, you get your IV, you get your epidural, you get Pitocin, and they crank it up because what in my experience has been the doctors want you to labor during their office hours so they can still see patients and then they want to be able to walk over to the hospital or drive, walk in, deliver your baby, and be able to get home in time for dinner. And not not all doctors do this. I'm not saying this is not one shoe fits all. Right. And but, it was different. Yeah. And the times we were talking about. Right. Too. So, yeah. you know, it's been 23 years, almost 24 years since I've had the, my last baby. So things may be different. I mean, I, I have done doula births. And honestly, I think the only thing they don't do are enemas and shaving and episiotomies routinely but now i guess it's the the norm to be shaved you just do it yourself at home personally having that hair grow back in oh it was awful wasn't it holy smokes so awful who would ever do that voluntarily when you're sitting there with a sore (laughs) a sore crotch and you itch like it's nobody's business who who would want who would intentionally do that? I'm sorry. I'm very old school. Uh, yeah. It, so we're not laughing at you, ladies. I promise. Whatever no. you want to do yeah. with your body, it's, it's your, your business. Yes, it's your body. But when we were giving birth, you had no choice, and that's what we're talking about. And right. sometimes you can't reach to trim, and then other times oh, you wax or your partner helps you. I don't know. Anyway, sorry, we digress. But So your third birth... My third birth was really great. Honestly, I loved my doctor. Um, Because of my age, they considered me high risk, but I didn't have to go to like a high risk clinic or or anything like that. They really did want me to have an amniocentesis, and I really didn't want that because I was not going to terminate my pregnancy if something was wrong, so why bother? And there is a risk of miscarriage with it. And so. uh, but I do say I do. I do feel like I was a little bit bullied bet- by my husband and my doctor. He's like, your insurance pays for it. It's safe, and your chances of having a baby with Down syndrome increases dramatically with your age. And I did agree to it with the understanding that short of not having a head on its body, mm-hmm. I was not terminating this pregnancy. Mm-hmm. And as long as my doctor knew that and my husband knew that, I was not going to terminate. And I thought, well, if this baby does have Downs or does have a, a birth defect, I would like to be prepared and have my ducks in a row. Right. And, uh, and we did get to watch it, and it was pretty cool to see her, you know, move out of the way. And, of course, we didn't know what she was. And I didn't really, I didn't think about finding out. I know with my second one, I asked the doctor if I could find out the sex when they did the ultrasound. But they were doing the ultrasound for a cyst on my ovary, not for the mm-hmm. sex. Mm-hmm. And he, you would have thought I asked him to do crack. They just flipped out, like, we don't do ultrasounds for sex. Right, and now so it's so common. now it's like, can I have an ultrasound every appointment? So with my my daughter, when we we had to do the ultrasound to make sure she was out of the way, but she uh, she was my little flasher. She put her butt up to the screen <laughs> and showed us her lady parts, and I was like, oh, I don't even. I'm a lay person, and I know that it's a girl. <laughs> So it was kind of cool to know we were having a little girl and, and watch her, you know, move out of the way so they could do the amniocentesis. And I'm sure they gave me some kind of precaution. I don't remember. I just remember we found a baby store was going out of business. And so we left that appointment, went to this baby store and went shopping and bought the most adorable little baby girl clothes. Mm. And then I went home. And, uh, and it was kind of cool to have her DNA on a printout. I tried to get her to do it for a science project to do her own chromosomal uh, mapping and stuff. And she was like, no, that's okay. (laughs) (laughs) So I felt very well, I felt very taken care of in that pregnancy. 
And then when it was time to go to the hospital, they didn't put me into bed right away. I think I was only three centimeters, but they didn't want me to be, it was at um, Arnold Palmer at the time, okay. and they didn't want me to drive all the way home and then come back and be stuck in the traffic. Okay. I neglected to tell them that I did most of my laboring at home with my second one, but I told them I think I had her like in three hours after I got to the hospital. Wow. And they're like, no, no, nope, you come the minute you hear it, feel those contractions and stuff. And So I had her at 39 weeks, but I do remember going to my doctor's appointment the night before and saying, can you please get this baby out of my body? And my girlfriend had told me, which again, I didn't know what I was doing, ask him to strip your membranes, Mm. which I had no clue what that was. And that's when they uh, insert your fingers into the vagina, and if you're dilated enough, um, they can get into the cervix and release the amniotic sac away from your cervix. By sweeping. By sweeping. So they kind of go around, and yeah, and it burns like nobody's business. Nobody told me about that part either. But it did put me into labor, Mm. and um, because I was pretty uncomfortable. She was a very big baby. I had an enormous amount of amniotic fluid, I Mm. found out later. But um, so her birth experience was was good, I have to say, and they let me go home in 40 or 24 hours. They did take her away. I didn't. I mean, I got her for a few minutes, but then they took her to the nursery. My husband went with her, mm. but then I didn't hear from him or see her or anything. Couldn't get up because I had the epidural, and at the time that numbs you all the way down. Right. And finally, my husband came to my room, and I'm like, "Where's my baby? Where's our baby?" And he said, "Well, they won't bathe her because she won't stop pooping." Oh. And I'm like, "Just put a diaper on her and bring her here." I don't care if she gets a bath. Well, it's bodily fluid. They have to bathe them, and then they have to rewarm them because they bathe them in cold stuff. And so it was a while before I got her. But once I got her, I didn't get. I didn't. She didn't leave me yeah, at so all. Glad, I'm so glad they're changing that protocol, bathing the baby immediately and having to warm them. And we know better in midwifery practice, but. Anyway, that's a whole other subject. But so you got an epidural without birth. How that were you last feeling? one. Yeah. How were you feeling about that? Did you want it? Did you feel well, kind of I pressured did, into it? Or? I, they kept asking me for it, and I didn't really know what it was. I remember my girlfriend had one with her daughter, and she was like, oh, my God, it was so awesome. But, again, she's not a birthy kind of person, and I'm a baby, birthy, hippie-ish kind of person. But because the Pitocin was so, so hard. And why did they give you Pitocin? Just because? Well, my water released okay. at, um, I was still about four centimeters, I think. Okay. And they wouldn't let me walk because they were afraid I would leak amniotic fluid and slip in it and hurt myself. Not worried about the cord collapsing no. in front of your head. They just didn't mm, want you to... They didn't want... Like, stuff. I was going to be walking around dripping bodily fluid down the hallway. I, I hope, for the love of God, I hope I wasn't going to be doing that. Then it can't give you pennies. <laughs> well, they can, yeah, a, a, a something. diaper <laughs> or something. So um, once they put me back into bed, my contraction stopped. Okay. So they started the Pitocin. Okay. So I did that for probably four hours and I was exhausted it was like two in the afternoon and we had gone in at two in the morning and I was tired and I was hungry and I was irritable yeah and how did those and sorry I kind of interrupted you but how did those Pitocin contractions with your membranes released compare to not having Pitocin oh my gosh they were horrible I didn't have time to acclimate. Your body needs to acclimate. That's why you have stages of labor. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't acclimate. And they were coming like, bam, bam. And I couldn't catch a break or get a breath. And they kept coming in. Do you want the epidural? Do you want the epidural? And finally, I was like, well, yes. And then my, it was my girlfriend's husband was the anesthesiologist. Oh, that's nice. And uh, his name was Mike Berlander. And when he came in, I'm like, oh, my God, my is her so bad. And he's, in fact, we had our baby showers together. Oh, wow. And he, um, he said, well, don't you worry. I'm going to fix you right up. All I could do is suck it up. And I kept thinking to myself, if you start to cry, you will not stop. Mm. And really, in hindsight, I should have cried because that release of tears 
releases the endorphins and things mm-hmm. and is just cleansing. I wish I had allowed myself to really cry. Right. But then once he got that epidural in, oh my gosh, I was like a different person. Mm-hmm. I was able to wash the makeup because <laughs> I was looking so beautiful at the time, of course. I put my makeup on. I was able to wipe the makeup off of my under my eyes where it was black, and I was able to brush my sweaty hair a little bit. Right. And um, I could feel the pressure of the contractions, but I didn't feel the pain. Now, could you move your legs? No. Like oh, no. with mine, because back nah. then, the epidurals, uh-uh. and even when I started, and I'm sure to you too, when you started your career as a doula, the epidurals were so strong, you would just, you couldn't what? move. No, and I didn't know that after they give you the epidural, they're going to catheterize you. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I'm like, what? Because you can't get up to You can't light. get up to B, yeah. So I looked at my husband and I said, get out. <laughs> yeah. And they catheterize me, and then they they take it out right before you deliver. But I could tell the difference between the contraction and then the one that wanted made me want to push. Mm-hmm. So I remember saying to my husband, go and get the nurse because something has changed. Mm-hmm. And I had really, really great nurses. And, oh, and we were, were good people. I mean, good patients. We right. were good. So, um, and my daughter was there. My mother was there. My mother-in-law, my father-in-law. I think my father had gone home. The nurse came in and she checked me and she's like, Mrs. Folsom, please don't move. Please don't cough. Your baby's right there. Mm-hmm. Your doctor's not going to make it. I'm um, in another room. We're in another room with delivering, but we really want to be at your birth, which I thought was really sweet, mm-hmm. even though they could have probably gone home. So they went and got a resident. My best friend was there to videotape. Because I wanted this on film. I was like, you get that camera in my crotch. And, uh, and they let you do that. And <laughs> probably the last person to get to videotape. He, he didn't have any problem with me videotaping. And I think I pushed her out probably in four pushes. Wow. And uh, she was a big girl, uh, nine pounds. Well, actually, she was 8'15". Mm-hmm. But because she pooped so much, I'm taking that extra ounce. Okay. Yeah. But she laid so peacefully in her little bed, her little plastic bin. Now, did she go directly to your chest after she was born? Or did, you know, was it the your baby's born and they held her up and said, oh, here's your baby. Isn't she pretty? And then sent her immediately you know, to the I don't warmer. remember. I don't remember holding her. So mm-hmm. I think so. I yeah. think she did go right to the warmer. And then they put her, while they were suturing me, you know, because of the scar tissue, you're right. most likely going to separate i don't like the t that tearing word yeah i call it skin separation yes, that's, <laughs> yeah, well i like the scar tissue yeah my midwife said it can act kind of like sorry ladies but it can act like a zipper almost right yeah but i do remember we would watch her birth video every year on her birthday and she grew up in the business of mm-hmm. doulas and midwives and she had been to births with me so she saw the nurse walking by and giving her a little whack you know, she's laying there all peaceful, naked, and, and just kind of looking around, very alert. And they give her a little whack, and she cries. And she's like, Mommy, why are they hitting me? Mm. And I'm like, Honey, I don't know. I think probably to make sure you were breathing. But I literally took that child in our hot tub with me, naked, and kind of reenacted a little little birth with her. Oh, that's wonderful. Just to have her on my chest just to hold her to say I'm sorry I didn't know then what I know now yeah because that affects babies yeah they know when they're in you know put in a cold bin and and then I was taken to my room and didn't know where she was her and my husband disappeared and I guess she was a real pooper and they wouldn't (laughs) bathe her until she quit pooping (laughs) I'm like just bring her to me yeah I just birthed this baby. I can't walk. I can't move. And then I got yelled at. The one thing I will say, and I did not know this, was um, it was all a good birth experience, but, you know, they give you this little mesh piece of rectangle material that's supposed to um, uh, suffice as underwear. Yes. Well, I didn't know it was not to be thrown. I thought it was disposable. Yeah, I thought it was too. Who expects a woman to wear this again and again? What, are you supposed to wash it out yourselves? They give you two pair. I threw it away. And the nurse came in and said, where's where's your underwear? I was like, well, I thought it was disposable. I threw it away. Well, 
Jeez, you would have thought I'd thrown away a priceless piece of jewelry. <laughs> so I got to have my one pair. <laughs> With the big old pads they give you and covers nothing. I will, and the thing too with those mesh panties, which with the big fat them, seam. Yeah, if you take them home, you know, and you wash them out, they do dry quickly. Like yeah. Sometimes some nice nurses will give you extra ones, right? But the thing is, the adhesive won't stick to them. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you put them in there, and then they just plop on the floor, right? Uh, you yeah. know, it just slides right out. It's awful. It's yeah. Awful. Depends on your pants, ladies. Those. Oh yeah. Those oh my amazing. gosh. Yeah. So I wish I had known about them. Yeah. Yeah, among the many things I wish I had known. Yes, just uh, just go to uh, Michelle's website and we'll tell you <laughs> what to get. <laughs> and padsicles. Yeah. I, nobody told me about any padsicles. Yeah. <laughs> That's when you put some witch hazel on a, a pad and put it in the freezer. But don't freeze it. Just put it on this, this side because it will be a brick. Don't use water. Witch hazel. Otherwise, you're going to get a brick to put between your legs. You know, but I like taking the baby diapers and opening the back. Oh, the yeah. The disposable uh-huh. ones and putting ice in there yep. and folding it up. Because nowadays, pads are so thin. Sometimes yeah. those padsicles, they melt the minute that you put them next you put to them your own body. So it kind of, you know, it's preference, I think. But the witch hazel does really help a lot. With my second birth... I tend to have my babies on their due date. My fourth, I missed it by um, less than an hour. So it's the only thing I do on time, my tease. But um, <laughs> I had, you know, I went into labor and or I kind of felt like I was going to go into labor and we got Chinese food that night. And then later I'm like, oh God, I don't know if I should have eaten this because I feel kind of funky. And I was laying on the couch and I felt what felt like a balloon pop inside of me. And there was this huge gush of fluid, and thank goodness we had the couch with the Scotch guard on it. <laughs> <laughs> so her water broke. So I'm like, oh, I need to go to the hospital, right? Because my water broke. And I naively thought that just a pad would suffice. <laughs> and I made it okay to the hospital. And, and her head must have been really high in my pelvis, too, because when my water broke, like it gushed all over the couch. And then I had to go stand in the tub because it was pouring out. And when I got to the hospital, I was still only two centimeters. But anyway, that walk-in, I naively thought that this pad is going to be enough. And by the time I reached triage, my pants were soaking wet. I remember, though, before I went into labor, it was very disconcerting to me because I had 19 different doctors, and I didn't know who was going to be on call. And even though I had had such a negative experience with my first obstetrician, it was nice to know who was going to be taking care of me. Mm -hmm. And so when the physician that took care of me when I had my miscarriage walked into triage, I remember thinking this strangely palpable thought of, oh, hey, I know him. I can have my baby now. They got me in a room, and because I was ruptured, my membranes had ruptured, of course, they gave you Pitocin. And my body loves pit. I will dilate quickly, because with my first, I forgot to mention, I went in there at 2.30 in the morning, and she was born at 11.17 in the morning. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it was just, it's probably, too, why our heart rate was going down, because I was dilating so quickly. Anyway... I get in the room, and I have this wonderful nurse. And my nurses were good, too, with my first. But this nurse understood, because I'm like, I want my baby on my chest. This is what happened to me. I couldn't hold her or touch her. And she said, same thing happened to me. I'll make sure that that doesn't happen to you. And she was smart, because she asked me, do you want to get up and walk around with your contractions? I was like, no, I'll just lay here in the bed, fetal style, like I do with my horrible menstrual cramps, right? And I'm like all curled up and the Pitocin's kicking in and the contractions can be more intense with Pitocin and when your water's broken. And I'm kind of crying. My husband, bless his heart, now I understand as traumatic as our first birth was, he didn't know what to do. Like he was completely checked Mm -hmm. out. And we were under some stress anyway in our lives at that time. But the physician came in and I was crying with the contraction And he just said, give her something. They don't ask you back then. So he gave me Demerol. 
Do you know, Meg, I can't even take Benadryl. <laughs> yeah, she's a cheap date. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, I, I think that it felt like the room was spinning and platform shoes were not in style 26 years ago. <laughs> I was talking about platform shoes. My husband and the nurse are laughing at me and I'm just high as a kite and out of it. At some point, I felt that pressure, like I needed to pee, like you were talking about. Of course, I couldn't get out of the bed, so they put me on a bedpan because I felt like I really needed to pee. Now I understand it was her moving down. And my nice nurse went to lunch, because who would have thought I would dilate so fast, right? I remember sitting there and feeling that pressure. Her head's coming down, and I sat up in the bed, and I'm thinking, oh, dear God, I have to push. So we called the nurse, she comes in, and she did that wonderful thing of patting me. No, honey, it's too soon. You don't need to push yet. (laughs) And I remember looking at her in my Demerol-induced haze (laughs) and telling her, I have to push, and I have to push now. And so they check me, and I'm complete. And then, of course, they're scrambling and trying to find the doctor. And they put you back, and you're pushing, and... You know, you're supposed to take behind your legs. And I was just had my arms up at the top of the bed and push in. And then they were like, are you a cyclist or something? Your legs are so strong. Like I'm almost knocking them over. (laughs) (laughs) But my body just took over. Yeah. Three contractions. Baby was out. I did get her on my chest, but I'm sure she went to the warmer first because that's what they did back then. I did get her. I remember feeling so disappointed because I was so tired. I crashed from that Demerol. I just crashed. And I remember I wanted nothing more to be able to hold my baby on my chest. I was so tired and out of it. I remember just having her there and kind of pat, half patting her and thinking, all I want to do is just go to sleep. I just want to go to sleep. I'm so, I'm so tired. I just need to sleep. Like as you and I were talking today, I don't even remember what happened after that. But I do remember the next morning being asleep and a physician walked in and I woke up and I didn't know him. And, you know, like we were talking about those of us that have a history of trauma, that was very disconcerting to have this strange man in my room. And thank goodness he was astute enough to, this is who I am, you're okay, you're here. But it was a, I mean, it was a a better birth in many ways, but still there were elements in it where I had no autonomy, I wasn't asked. You know, if a woman's telling you that she needs to push and it's her second baby, then listen to her. (laughs) And when she's in triage with her membranes ruptured, you don't need to have an opinion that her seven-year-old is still up watching Winnie the Pooh with her at 10 o'clock at night. It's like not really your opinion. It doesn't matter. You know, save that for yourself. So it was better. And then my third birth, I found a birth center. I found special beginnings, and it was really, like I alluded to in my welcome episode, it was really very healing and a completely different level of support. I remember in one of my prenatal visits when Suzanne asked me to tell her my birth history, and I was sharing what happened. And I was so nonchalant about it because it was like, well, this is just what happened and be grateful because you have a healthy baby and you're a healthy mom and this is just how women are treated and we just have to put up with it because that's how things work and babies don't have any feelings and all of those things that happened. And when she looked at me and said, Michelle, that must have been so traumatic for both of you, I, I... Bald. And even when I was recording the episode, I started crying again because she was the first person to acknowledge how traumatic that was and that it was okay that I felt violated mm-hmm. and that it was inappropriate for the things that my physician said and how I was treated. And it was really such a healing experience. That birth was, it was very wonderful and 
eight pounds of baby came through my body and two contractions and it was <laughs> wow you know, yeah yeah and but it was it was really a good experience it was a little frustrating because my husband's boss wasn't going to let him leave and finally the midwife said you know he really needs to get here he's coming from Kissimmee so thank goodness I had a doula but you know I'll delve into that story more at another time and then my fourth I had a home birth and used midwifery care and again, when I shared it with my midwife, Kathy, her jaw physically dropped talking about what happened. And, you know, I didn't expect to revisit that trauma again. But when her head, when I was in labor and her head got low in the pelvis, mm-hmm. it just triggered. I didn't expect it because the other birth was so great. My third, that, that feeling... Like, I was triggered back to that trauma 22 years earlier, and I really thought I had done the work to heal it, and I had done a lot of work, but that feeling just triggered me, and I was in that pool saying to myself, I'm safe, I'm safe, I'm safe. So thank God I had Robin and Kathy there with me, and they really helped me to walk through that and what I teach and what I learned really saved me in that birth. And I'm grateful for it because it it really renewed my commitment to help mamas that have experienced, and dads, that have experienced birth trauma and to delve deeper into that, to address it in ways that weren't addressed for us. It just wasn't. No, absolutely. Uh, we were just told, oh, well, you have a healthy baby. And I don't even know if we knew to think any differently because we were coming out of that era where women still weren't smart enough to know what happens to their bodies. We're too frail-minded and no education and, and all of that. And doctors were gods. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it is, it is much better. And... If you yourself have experienced any kind of birth trauma, know that there are resources out there for you to help you to work through it. And I think it's important, too, to work through it if you can before you get pregnant again, but definitely to do some work to heal it before you give birth again so you don't carry that trauma with you. Because, like for myself, I have a history of trauma. I think that's, like looking back, too, part of why I got triggered and and which is you know a deeper subject that we'll go into another time but know that there are resources know that you're not alone and that you can heal from it and your baby can heal from that trauma too and doing things like Meg did which is so wise to get in the hot tub and recreate the birth and just to really bond with your baby and tell your baby it's okay and you can recreate a healing field to release that trauma, especially if you're intentional with it. So any other wise thoughts, my Meg? I don't think so. Again, it's just educate yourself, trust your body, trust that you know what you know. Mm -hmm. And don't be afraid to speak up for yourself. I was always too afraid. My favorite phrase to uh, to give to my clients is, is it medically necessary? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because then they'll catch them off guard and they're like, uh, 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 well, uh, well, no, we just do. Well, if it's not medically necessary, I decline. Right. Also to ask sometimes if they're presenting something, well, what's the evidence behind that? What, mm-hmm. what makes you feel that that's the best way? Or why do you feel I need to be induced at 39 weeks because I turned 36 three days ago? Look at the research and educate yourself and have them tell you the research. Because so often it's not presented with both sides. Exactly. Exactly. So. There's lots of good resources out there. There's a lot of stuff that's overwhelming, but evidence-based birth is a wonderful source to help educate yourself and, you know, check with the local doulas and midwives in the area. They'll tell you, if, if they tell you this is the hospital to go to, 
please listen to them. Mm -hmm. They see it. They know. They know. They're there. Again, thank you, my Meg. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you all for joining us. For more great conversations like these, or to find out more information and access Michelle's library of amazing guests, go to birthdeeservices.com forward slash podcast. For more information on the Birthdees Method, Michelle's classes, meditations, and other services, go to birthdeeservices.com. <laughs>